Welcome, everyone, to this special edition of Monday Match Analysis. Today's episode is a conversation with Carousel and Clay Thompson. Uh, I know that the City Open Final in Washington, D.C. actually changed the name. So the Mubadala City Open Final uh, has gone down, and I will be creating some content on the final, maybe a little bit different than, than normal. Uh, but as of now, I am away on a social trip. This is a pre-recorded thing, and I thought this would be a, a great time to have a conversation with Clay and crew, which I've wanted to do for a little bit. The backstory is this. Uh, they reached out to me uh, because they wanted to include the content on my channel, at least some of it, on this new improvement platform called Improve which Clay is kind of on the business side of, and Karu, who you may know from My Tennis HQ, uh, he is on the more of the content side of that venture. So I was honored for, for that, and my, uh, my content has been added to their curriculum. Again, it's a improvement uh, platform, and I will include the link in the description of how to sign up for Improve, which, which I think is uh, an incredible curation of the the smartest and the best tennis related content on the internet. I will leave a link to that platform below. It also has some some uh, customization kind of aspects to it. And if you use that link and you sign up, this channel gets kicked back. So you're also uh, supporting in that respect. But outside of that, uh, Clay was a, a top ranked junior nationally, you know, number one through the, you know, the 12s to the 16s. Uh, number one in NCAAs, he played at UCLA, got to a career high of 408 in the world. Carew also played at UCLA, got to 341 in the world. Again, uh, just killing it on the YouTube side of things with My Tennis HQ, which is an online tennis academy. So what we're going to do is talk to Carew and Clay about tennis, have a really deep conversation about some topics that they have intimate and kind of insider knowledge about. Uh, yes, we are going to talk about a lot of American players. If that's not, if it doesn't float your boat, um, I just hope the content of the conversation is going to kind of make up for that. But uh, the reason is that they have a connection to a lot of these players who we will be discussing. All right. So without further ado, Clay Thompson, Carousel, our conversation. I lied. Two more things. One, Carew has been on tour with Marcos Giron part-time as a coach, so there will be some references to that, and I just wanted to say that off the top. And two, sorry about the bad audio on my end in this interview. The good thing is that Clay will sound good and Carew will sound good, but I didn't really have my microphone settings correct for most of the interview. Apologies for that. Now here's the discussion. We're joined for the first time by Carousel and Clay Thompson. Guys, really appreciate you coming on Monday Match Analysis. Looking forward to, to having some deep and hopefully insightful conversations. So thank you guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. You're one of the best in the game right now, and I really appreciate and uh, value what you're, what you're bringing to the table. Thanks for that. So if the theme of our discussion, which obviously we've been brought together by Improve, is going to be improvement, I want to start by talking about Chris Eubanks, who uh, I don't think I've actually covered as much as I, I've wanted to over the course of his Mallorca title as Wimbledon run. He's top 30 player this week now for the first time. You guys have both played him, I understand. Carew, you've played him? Yeah, I've played him. I, I got a 1-0 score on him. <laughs> wow. Okay. That, that, okay. And Clay, you too, right? And it's on YouTube. Uh, I didn't I've, I've never it, played so. him in a in a match setting. I've practiced with him multiple times, though. Okay. So Carew, as as someone who's who's conquered him, when you're watching him now this year, how's he different from how he was when when you played him? I mean, it, it's a tricky thing because it, it's actually funny we're talking about him. I, act, I We got to spend a good amount of time uh, in this grass court season. Uh, he basically played every term, every event that we played. Uh, so, you know, we were having dinners together, like me, him, Marcos, Ruan. Um, and I, I never really got to spend that much time with him uh, before. And I think, you know, in terms of, in terms of his game – I mean, it's pretty straightforward what he needs to be doing, right? Like, he, he's not going to outgrind guys. He's not going to, to you know, play a very physical game. If anything, like, it's he's one of the most, like, 
his matches, like you, we watch him play. He's he's it feels like he's never tired because the points are quick. He he's pretty clear cut with what he's doing. Um, and to be honest, I mean, he had had the. It was a tricky thing always with him because I feel like you know I think we had chatted before with other players like Chris had this thing where it's like he was really good at like qualifying for the slams and 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 you know winning a round of the slams but I felt like it was weak equally as likely to lose first round of a challenger you know what I mean it, it was kind of like he could beat anyone we can lose to anybody at a very wide range um where you know it seems like this year he started putting together a little bit like deeper runs in those those bigger events um and i think honestly i think it just trend it's all just like eventually becomes confidence even even in the beginning of that grass court season he he wasn't really i mean he was struggling with it like if we were chatting he was like yeah i mean what is this this surface kind of you know and and you know he had that tweet that he he asked him Kleiser what to do kind of thing and and why not? And and we were there. I mean, he literally, like, I think the next day showed us the text. Um, and I think uh, slowly but surely, um, it, it all clicked. You know, I think he he's working on moving forward a little bit more, which is, like, going to be a big part of his game, like, making sure he's, like, putting those volleys away a bit more. Um, but he is a guy where it's, if he's that confident, you know, I watched his, his match with, with uh, against Nori, and, I mean, he was like closing his eyes and just ripping it. And and I think once he finds his balance of, you know, playing that op- offensive game um, and managing maybe the back inside a little bit more, I mean, he's going to be super dangerous and there's no reason he, he shouldn't be probably, you know, top 50. Now he's top 30. Um, but um, it maybe just took him a little longer to, to figure it all out and put it all together. But that's really what it is. Put it, put it all together and go at it. Tall player, aggressive player. Maybe some of the things that that you just assessed, you know, the inconsistencies, the fact, uh, the power of confidence, and just how much of an impact that can have on his effectiveness. That style maybe accentuates those those qualities a little bit. Would you say? Yeah. So I mean, Clay, you you're the tall tall big player guy here, so you can tell me. Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, I, I love Eubanks. He's such a great guy. I think he works really hard, and he's just put himself in a position to succeed um, time after time after time. And I always kind of tell this story because I think it's it's kind of funny. The first time I ever met him was I was a senior in college, I believe, and he was a freshman in college at Georgia Tech. And there was like a USTA, I think it might have been summer or winter, sort of get-together of all the top college players. And Eubanks was there and he was still a freshman, but he was like, people were like, oh, he's kind of good. And I had never heard of him before. And so I'm like, oh, okay, like, who is this guy? And we started hitting and I kid you not, I don't think we had more than a five ball rally. <laughs> and that's coming from me who is like, you know, not the most consistent player or wasn't the most consistent player in my day. But I was like, I would turn around. I'd be like, what's going on here? Like, he like can't make two balls in a row like who is this guy and so i think that that's exactly kind of to your point it's it's finding out how to work with your weapons and finding out how to play a strategy that covers up your weaknesses and you know promotes your strengths and i think that's what he's learning to do so well now and you know this this kind of conversation came up with with novikov too sort of the same thing when he was at ucla was like his movement was so bad but he just played around it. Like you didn't see that when you were in the point with him and same kind of thing with Eubanks when he's playing his best tennis. And obviously he's gotten a lot better since that freshman year, but when he's playing his best tennis, you don't realize that he's not the most consistent player in the world because he's just hitting his spots and he's keeping the point short and he's taking the racket out of your hand. And he's setting records for most winners ever hit at Wimbledon. In that a single, it was in the yeah. quarterfinals, and he, he he had the record. That was bananas. That's yeah. I mean, that's amazing. It doesn't matter if you can't make three balls in a row. <laughs> if you're doing that, you don't need to. Yeah. No, he's that. Yeah. You, can, you can never see he's like you know he's starting to like figure out like how to just kind of manage that back inside a little bit more. He really likes that back in line. Um, he's starting to hit that one a little bit better. Um, and yeah, like Clay said, it's hard to expose. I mean, I, I like playing guys like him. I like playing guys like play like the tall guys I have a good return I, I absorb pace well and I redirect that pace well so for me the matchup um you know I remember him playing him and, and to, to the point of, of of clay I was I lost the first set seven six and I was just in my head I'm like what the fuck is going on 
Um, sorry if I can curse, but uh, um, I, this guy like really couldn't make that many balls in a row. But like you know, I just ne- I don't have any chances, and he plays that pressure, and 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 you know, I sort of figure out some things on the on the return there that that helped me. But at the end of the day, if he's seeing the ball the way he's seeing, and he you know he can ride this as for as long as possible. This is going to be, there's no reason why he couldn't be, um, you know, a, a perennial like top 30 player. And, and you know, his serve is, it, it's actually not that big. I think people think it's bigger than it is. It's just, he's a really, really good spot server. And, and he doesn't miss the spot. People will return against him, like trying to like, oh, maybe he misses spot and I'll, I'll get a return here. He won't. So you have to really make that that those spots like smaller and smaller, and it, it's hard to play, and, and you're playing a big risk game. So, um, I mean, props to him. I mean, he has a good attitude, and he just kept kept chipping away. And I, I like to see guys doing that where they just slowly chip it away uh, if they at the at first don't have like totally the level just yet. That's what's so what, what's so interesting about the story and the timeline is that he's 27 years old. That's late to do something like this to make this kind of leap. Uh, it's not a case of, oh, he lacks experience or a case of, oh, he's just a young guy who's not really developed physically yet. We see that often, I guess, early 20s, right, with players getting better and it's kind of that natural improvement. Uh, but I think what's so interesting in in Chris's case is it, it took until now for him to, I guess, put it all together and the the nice thing about chris is because he's such a he's such a good communicator that he can kind of explain to us how this happened uh and the things he said like when on mike cation's podcast i think the first thing that's interesting about his story is he seemed to kind of hit rock bottom before all this and it was just this isn't working i'm sick of challengers and that seemed to completely open his mind up to you know, making whatever changes need to happen. And in this case, it was it was commitment to warm ups, commitment to cool downs, like all that stuff that I think I haven't actually seen as as closely probably ever as you guys of of what the process is before matches, after matches, before training, after training, just actually fully committing to that. And then also some some stuff about getting more comfortable with where to volley, because I think a lot of coaches his whole life have been like, go, come forward, go forward, go forward. But he just needed to fine tune, I guess, uh, how he was volleying and where he was volleying. But I think there's a lot of interesting aspects there of like, do you need to get to that point where maybe you're struggling so much that you can no longer be stubborn? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, there's definitely a part of that that it's, you know, your back's against the wall and and, and you're going to have to to – make the, the, the necessary change. I think it's hard to make the change sometimes when things are kind of working out and you kind of have a sniff that, you know, because he, he did, like, he wins big matches. I mean, he would qualify twice a year to a slam, but, like, couldn't really break 130. You know, it was it was an interesting, it was an interesting sort of uh, career trajectory that he was having. It was, like, making way more money than most, like, guys playing challengers because he would win this big big kind of matches but then not really um performing the challenges where he needed to like kind of get out of there so um you know i think probably props to to rule on as well i think you know he hired a guy who who was a really good net player um and kind of plays it played a similar game big forehand coming in and um you know slowly push Rolf yeah. Or, yeah yeah the south African like guy. guy he's a great guy yeah he's a great dude um so i think he's he's probably Again, maybe open the eyes a little bit on where to volley or how to like really w- when to come in, when to make those those decisions. Because um, for him, it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be making Roger Feather pick up all it. You know what I mean? He just mm-hmm. I think needs to add that pressure. I think Clay Clay played his best tennis when he was doing that. You know, remember Clay? Like I mean, the guy was just, he, anything that's set up. He was coming in and it was really difficult to play. So. Yeah. And and to my previous point, I think that's kind of what is helping make him successful and which is basically he's playing a style that is not, and same thing with Cressy, like he's playing a style that these players are not that used to, like they're used to hitting a lot of balls. They're used to playing with someone that 
can grind with them. And, you know, whether it's a Fritz who's an aggressive player, but still has incredible ground strokes and consistency, base can still respect them from the ground. I feel like with Eubanks, that's kind of the thing that's getting under his opponent's skin a lot is they're feeling like if we were just playing on the ground, I would be destroying you. But like, it's so weird to play this guy who's just stepping in and taking these like huge swings and painting the lines. And like, what do I do? And there, there's kind of an added element of like frustration. And obviously, you know, I capitalized on that a lot when, when I started serving volleying in college, just because no one else was doing it. And you know, that, that's a huge benefit when you play a different style than everyone else. And I think, you know, Eubanks is, especially at Wimbledon, I just think he was a train that no one had even seen before. And they're just like getting rolled over by him. I mean, when he beat Nori, I was, I was blown away. I was, hilarious. I have it was so hilarious. much respect, I so much respect for Nori. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And I was like, Eubanks just came in and freight trained him. Yeah, there was no chance. Yeah, I mean, when guys hit second serves to righty backhands, like a kick, I mean, Nori would be a lefty, and he's just chipping it and coming in. I mean, how often are they seeing that? So I, I love that point um, about yeah, I mean, him think, changing it up stylistically. I just think, like, in general, like, tennis nowadays, like, aside from, you know, a few guys, like, everyone is kind of like a poor man Novak. You know, everyone's really good from the back, really fast. Um, there's no really, like, no one has, like, a hole, like, really. It's like, oh, just play to the back and you're going to be okay. Even even a Casper Rude, who everyone's like, it was back and it's bad. Like, you can't just, like, hit there. He's going to hit good balls there. So everyone just kind of plays that style. It's a, it's a normal thing. It's an evolution of, of, of the sport that came, I think, with Novak and, and Rafa. And, and, and so... You know, we see in basketball, everyone's chucking up threes because, you know, because of Steph. Um, you know, you kind of emulate what, what is working until someone can somehow break break away from that um, very effectively. So what Chris is doing, I think what Cressy does, obviously. Um, but I think the next guy, you know, you know, someone that can be kind of like a Medvedev from the back, but also a, a Chris coming in, you know, a guy who's 6'6", can lock it in from the back like Medvedev, but can also like throw the serve and volleys and play aggressively um, and mix that in is going to be probably um, a guy that dominates alongside obviously Carlos. But Carlos does that. I mean, Carlos, like you play two points from the back uh, well against him, he serves and volleys. He's like, no, you're not doing that anymore. He throws a drop shot. He just kind of keeps you like, you know, not really like just comfortable um that way and so you know i think that that's really kind of where where we're headed because everyone's too fast and too fit yeah or you know this trend to stand really really deep on first serve return and you've seen guys get so many returns in play with this mm -hmm. with this strategy and it's become so popular and alcaraz won't let you do it like medvedev mm -hmm. is completely neutralized by it uh because of the the drop volleys and the drop the plus one drop shots. So, uh, yeah, I, I did want to talk about Alcaraz, but I also want to talk about Cressy, who we've already mentioned. Another UCLA guy. Uh, you guys, both UCLA guys, uh, we had some overlap with uh, Cressy as well. This, he's almost, to me, like an experiment on tour in this era. And that's why it's been so fun to follow him, even if he's not tearing it up, so to speak. It's still always someone who you're going to have your eye on because you're like, is this going to work? Can this work? I mean, I, I remember, you know, for the late, you know, in the late 2010s, it was always kind of a debate of if this is possible. And the fascinating thing about kind of tracking Cressy, especially, you know, this year is to me, the serve and volley is working. His first serve, when I looked a couple weeks ago, he was sixth on tour in first serve points, one percentage. Now he's got a big serve, but he, that's a serve and volley every time. There are other issues which to, which I think are preventing him from, from winning as much as he wants to, but it's not the serve and volley. To me, when you look at the stats, like the serve and volley is working. Is that is that a, an assessment that that you agree with, Karu? Oh yeah, I mean, I think the serve, I mean, I, I joke a lot about the serve and volley thing, like in this last five weeks with Marcos on, on, on grass, I'm like, I'm, I'm watching matches, I'm like, look at that, should have served and volley. Because like, there's a, again, everyone is back, and what is the return that everyone wants? The deep middle return. 
but that's that's the ball like let's deep middle ball, the points neutral let's go at it so the guys who are serving and balling in even at, at on I think at the at the French Open, like guys were winning a lot more points serving and volley than, than they were. In. Um and so Cressy, I mean it it's uh, it's a no brainer that he needs to serve and volley. Like he he struggles. I haven't been pl- watching his matches uh, aside from the Jared match uh, at Wimbledon. Um but in general like serving volley well executed serving volleys and well timed if you're if you're doing it maybe you're not so like predictable about it like because he has the serve to do it he has to keep doing it. but if you're a shorter guy and you don't have like really the huge serve um even then like i think you're winning like a pretty high percentage of those points um so you know if you watch the, the that match that was it was nori versus machak uh, I don't know if I'm butchering his name, but um, the, I think it's I think, I think it's Tomas Mahach. Yeah, Mahach. Yeah. yeah. So he got started cramping, and then started serving and volleying because he was just like, I can't, I can't play from the back. His hand was cramping, and he was winning like a lot of those points. But he was kind of doing it almost like he didn't believe that it was going to work, but it was working, and he just like kind of like just kind of rolled with it. And I'm like, dude, you're winning more points doing this. Like, you're not going to beat Nori from the back. What are you doing? Um, so it's just like a tricky thing where it's like, I think, you know, Cressy or regards, like, what are you going to do when you play Novak? Like, are you going to beat him from the back? You're not going to. It's just not going to happen. So you have to be able to sneak that in more often than not. And and so I think it's a it's an it, – it has to happen, and and for for Max, I mean, he, he's doing first and second he, as he should. And he shouldn't stop doing it. But the belief aspect is important because it, yeah. it takes almost audaciousness. It takes I don't know balls to yeah. to do something that nobody's doing. Which yeah. I, I think Clay, you can kind of speak to because you know Max and and how he is, and I feel like he has that kind of unique makeup that's allowed him to play this way, right? Yeah, and I think that's what made him successful. Um, one of my mentors when I was young was a top ten, former top 10 player named Derek Rostanio. And he told me one time, uh, I think he got to like the quarters of the US Open or something, but he told me one time, he said, um, in order to serve in volley, you have to have very thick skin. And I think that's a great quote. I really do. Because you do have to have that ability to just serve and just the guy drills a winner past you and you're like, all right, I'm going to do it again. Yeah, we're doing <laughs> you, have to, you have to have very thick skin to do it. Um, and, you know, I respect all the players that, that use it as a tactic. I think my frustration is, and this is to what you're saying as well, is my frustration is that the players that utilize the serve and volley don't really have any other options. No way Cressy's beating you from the back. There's just no way. Karlovich same kind of thing like who else is a prominent servant volley like max mirney like just not beating you from the back i feel like the great servant like when i think of great servant volley i think of like pete sampras i think he was the best he's gonna beat you in a baseline game he's yeah. not doing it because he's like i truly cannot stay in a baseline point with you he's doing it because it's giving him the best chance to win and then you know he can stay back and beat you on a baseline point the next point but I just feel like all the modern servant volleyers, again, and, and they're, they are moderately successful, which I'd love to see. But I'd love to see someone that has – servant volley is technically like an all-around game. It's supposed to be an all-around game. And I just feel like the people that have utilized it recently, they have literally no other option. And so I'd like to see someone with a little bit more well-roundedness utilize the servant volley and see what it does for them. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if Nick committed to basically just playing like – 75% of his serve points serve and volley, but then play the way he plays from the back on returns. That's just an unbelievably like difficult player to play. Yeah. Utilize like, yeah. sneak attack return. Yeah, like, sneak you know, attack returns, yeah. but he can he can lock it in from the back. He can play. I mean, he's great from the back, but like think about his with his serve, serve and volley 75% of the time. Um, and it doesn't matter if guys know. Like, I, you know, it's a, it's an interesting thing we're talking about because I I was I played a few few tournaments this year and I was playing the finals against this kid who really solid player from the back, Zach Svida's brother. And I sort of psyched myself out before the match, and I was like, this kid is good from the back. And and I lost the first set six three, and I was just kind of like, what am I like? And I was just, I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna serve and volley a few times, and I did it, and he worked, and then he worked. 
and then he worked and he worked and I was like is he gonna make an adjustment or is he gonna keep trying to return down the middle and I was just having like easy like serve a wide volley open course or serve a wide volley open course serve a wide volley open course and I did it so many times that match that he got me like so much confidence doing it that like in in in, in an event after that that I played I also wasn't really necessarily playing that well from the back, but that's always your default. I play the first set, you know, my normal game, ugh, not playing that well. And you're just sort of like get to a point where it's like, you know what, F it, I'm going to serve in volley like more. And I start doing it and he started working and then guys started like kind of panicking. And he, dude, he, he, he worked so much. Like I was doing it, like I was doing it all the time. I, I did it through those UTR events, through Ojai. Just like, you know what? You just played like a good point on my serve. I'm not going to let you do that again. I'm going to serve in volley. And then, and he's and just like, there's a, once you do it enough and you, you're you okay with the, um, with the consequence of getting passed or whatever, there's so much commitment to that decision. I, I played Ernesto Escobedo in one of those. I played, you know, a guy that like, I don't want to be behind on the point. So I'm going to serve in volley on the second serve and see what you do. You know, and, and so like there's so much commitment to that strategy that it becomes like it, it you're kind of relaxed. You're like, mm -hmm. this is what I'm doing. And, you know, whatever happens, happens. So it's just hard to get through that first phase of like, you know, I'm getting passed. I'm missing serves. Or, I, you know, I missed a couple of volleys because I'm a bit tense. But once you get through that, uh, it just becomes like very like natural and you're just like, this is what I'm doing. Let's live and die by it. There are also plenty of guys on tour who just don't volley well enough to be effective at it. Like you do need to have that well-rounded skill set. And I, 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 we can. there are guys in the top 10, the ATP top 10, who I think we would all agree, they can't serve in volley because they don't volley well enough. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a development thing. I mean, it's like, yeah. I guarantee you, it's not like they're not good enough to volley. It's just that they were in this rhythm of training ground strokes, hitting balls, you know, whatever, doing ground stroke rally drills, and they're just not developing, you know, that part of the game. And again, I think like the common junior quote is like, they'll be playing back the whole match. They'll serve in volley once, they'll get passed. And then they'll be like, oh, why did I come to that? I'm so stupid. It's like, yeah. I mean, I know so many players that have said that. And it's just the classic. Like they just, they don't, they don't realize that they're losing 60% of the points from the back anyway, and they lose one anyway, point at yeah. that. And it's like, oh, it's horrible. I should never go up there. Yeah. It's like, it's a, it's a statistical thing. Like if you, if you, if, you know, we don't have to look at it as like, oh, am I winning 90% of my first serve points? It's like, am I winning 60% or 58% of the times I serve in volley? You know what I mean? It's like, if I'm doing that and versus I'm winning 49% of the points from the back, it's like, I've seen Marcus play Medvedev twice this year. It's a nightmare from the back. Like you're always, yeah. you're always like fifty-two percent behind on the point. Always. You think you're kind of in the point, but you're not really. This, you this, know was, a, I mean? this so, was a super hot topic. So Carew and you know, uh, Marcos and a couple other our teammates got together recently, and I hadn't seen Marcos in a while, and I just drilled him up. What is it like playing Medvedev? Tell me everything. <laughs> like, I'm so curious <laughs> because I, I mean, I love that guy. Just I know it's a completely opposite style of serving volley, but it's. I kind of feel like he invented his own style in a way and his, you know, funky mechanics just serve to exacerbate it, I think, which is, I, I mean, I love it. I, I'm such a fan of his and I'm such a supporter of like bringing something that, you know, people don't see on a regular basis. And now everyone's standing far back on the return. Everyone is trying to emulate Medvedev after his, his U.S. Open championship. To me, he's, he's the NBA dynamic where we started to see guys who are way too tall and they can dribble and shoot. And it's like, whoa, what is Kevin Durant? What is that? And I think Daniil, I mean, I think he covers the court as well as anybody. And now he has this serve return combination where he's a grinder who has a six foot six first serve. And it's a it's a ridiculous combination that I mean, I think in 2002, similar to Kevin Durant, it would be like, what is this? This guy's an alien. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. Uh, Clay, you mentioned development, and I want to kind of bring it to Alcaraz. I don't want to act like Carlos Alcaraz is the first 
well-rounded player of all time. He's not, uh, but there is a completeness to him at his age that is really, really different where it's like, no matter where he is on the court, what shot he's hitting, he's excellent at seemingly whatever he's trying to do. And like we, we saw with the big three, I think that all of them kind of had an impact on the way tennis was coached and, you know, the way players look to develop, like maybe Nadal put a, a larger emphasis on RPMs for some players. Uh, maybe rock for, for Roger, it was kind of creativity and kind of keeping variety alive. And, and for Novak, just the, the perfect technique, rock solid baselining. I'm wondering now kind of what Alcaraz's effect on the way tennis is played and the way tennis is coached might be. Uh, I have kind of a thought that it's like maybe he can help kind of take away some of the, you know, neglecting volleys, neglecting drop shots and that kind of thing. It's just like, no, we need everything. Uh, but uh, Carew, as, as someone who's kind of into this world of, of instruction and development, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I definitely want to think, yes, I, I, I agree that even if you look back at, at big three, I, I don't think they were as complete at the, the, the age. Um, obviously, Rafa, um, you know, was younger, winning Grand Slams and whatnot. But I, 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 in terms of like, I look at his game and I'm just kind of like, I'm not sure what can get much better. You know what I mean? And, and I, besides the serve, I think the serve is already like, I think in the last year made, made big strides. Um, I don't love the motion on the serve, um, but in terms of like technical things, like like you, you look at Rafa Novak uh, from you know 2004, 2007, Novak A10, like they have like pretty different strokes. Rafa obviously was always kind of tinkering. And I feel like every year he had a kind of like a different forehand swing, 100%. but it was fundamentally the same thing from contact to here was a fundamentally the same thing. It was just how he got there. Um, but they were always kind of like, kind of, I wouldn't say changing technique, and all, but like just kind of like, you know, adapting a little bit. Um, where Novak, Novak took a while for him to be sort of this like perfect technique. Serve was off, you know, for him, had like a big loop and all that stuff. Carlos, you look at him and he's just sort of like, the forehand is kind of, it's perfect. I mean, it's the forehand that like, I think anyone, any one of us would like to have the back end is really solid. He can be aggressive with it. The drop shots, the volleys are nice. They're not like bluffs. They're good volleys. He knows how to volley. And the serve is the only thing that feels a bit stiff still. Um, so I, I, in terms of like development and coaching, I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a creative guy playing myself. So I, I always like guys like that. Um, you know, Feather for me was was kind of like the goat in that way, and I just loved watching him play because you know it, it gives me you know Steph Curry is my favorite NBA player because of the creativity. He he allows himself the freedom to try things, but he also works on those things. Not like it's it's just you know it's just talent. Um, and so I think Carlos is the the closest I've seen from Roger in that way. Like he allows himself. To, to be creative and to try new things and to, to, you know, you know, use the dropper. Uh, I think he uses a dropper way more than like Roger used to, but coming in yeah. and serving ball and all that stuff. Um, and he plays hyper aggressive. Like he's really fast, but he plays hyper aggressive. I mean, he is taking it too, guys. So um, I, I think it depends in terms of the development. I, I don't know if how much he's going to, to, to move the needle that way because, you know, it seems like still like kind of playing the Novak style will get you there. You know what I mean? But I do believe that, you know, if I'm, if I'm coaching someone myself, I, I believe in that freedom for, for creativity and, and allowing, you know, I, I think even a guy like Maddie was a guy that probably wasn't very limited to like, Hey, play this way. It's like, here, you know how to do this thing very well. Let's see how, how we can yeah. you know utilize that to make you the best player possible so 
Um, I just hope that what Carlos is doing, like, inspires maybe like the the younger guys to to maybe see the game a little bit more that way. That that's all because I think that's how it goes. It's like you see, a, there's probably a little kid right now who's going to be unbelievably good looking at him and he's like, I want to play that way, and he's going to be really good at playing that way. I just think for for I'd say like the next the last ten years aside from Feather, we just wanted to everyone just wanted to play like Novak and Rafa, and and, and that kind of creates this this i think very homogenous way of playing tennis yeah i i, I know for me go, go ahead clay i was just gonna say i, I totally agree with with what Carew said about there kind of being a you know everyone playing sort of a synonymous style of play and i think it'll be interesting with with alcaraz to see with his development will he err towards being more creative or will he kind of rein it in and play more of a you know again synonymous type style that's that's the yeah. question i think you know, yeah, it, that's, that's, really that's true. to see because i i think with with carlos the, the the last thing i think i have on him is like how the, the main thing i think with him is like him picking his spots a little bit better right because he's had some injuries and you know he would make a crazy run when the guy's up like 40 love and that maybe he didn't need to so i, I think that's just kind of like how he's going to manage um his physicality and and how maybe hope let's say in five years or, or six years when he's starting to maybe lose a step maybe maybe not because it'll be 26 and prime but like at some point he's going to you know we we saw that from rafa right from being very far back running 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 to slowly inching into the baseline and playing a bit more aggressive especially on the hard court carlos already does that but he's so physical and he's so brutal on his body that like how will he rein that in, uh, like Clay said? So that that really is, you know, the arc that I'm I'm, I'm interested in. Like as I've watched his career, because everything else in mean, the guy is just perfect, really. Yeah, I think at some point he'll he'll age out of the balls to the wall kind of run down everything, no matter what the scoreboard says and all that. In terms of kind of scaling back the aggression in spots. I actually asked him about that in Miami because I'm also really interested in it in, in the press conference setting. And he, I, I still think that he doesn't, he's not as eloquent yet in English as he is in Spanish, but he, he basically said like, yeah, I've improved this year at kind of figuring out spots where I'm going to be solid. So I think he, he has started to value the ability to play both styles. And I do think we've seen that because there were some matches last year where, where he was very erratic. It was just an off day and there were a lot of unforced errors. I think now when he feels like his timing is off and he's not feeling the ball well, he'll, he'll inject some safety into his game. So I think he's improved in that respect. Before we get off the Alcaraz topic, uh, Clay, I, I love how you kind of think about things from you know a a big picture standpoint especially uh you know with the business mind that you have do you have any thoughts on just what the effect of alcaraz is in terms of of tennis's popularity in the next 10 15 years um one thing i wanted to mention earlier was just alcaraz effect in general i can't remember who told me this but i remember it was you know i think it might have been jonathan stokey or you know one of the the big name coaches out there that's working with a lot of juniors mm -hmm. it was like the Carlos Alcaraz effect is you walk around the practice courts and everyone's hitting a damn drop shot. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's hitting these bad drop shots and you just go, oh no, what's happening? <laughs> so I thought that was funny. Um, but the Alcaraz effect on the tennis world as a whole, again, I, I kind of likened it a little bit to LeBron James when, when we kind of first exchanged emails. I think that he is now especially the poster boy of the atp i think he is going to define success for the generation and it's going to be really interesting what he does with that but i think he has the keys to the kingdom and i think if the atp has the sense that they should i think they should put every resource into kind of elevating him as as this next gen player and to really or you know current gen player and to really try to you know, sell tickets around that. And and the great thing that the NBA did with LeBron is he carried the entire league. I mean, like there was people making max salary, you know, contracts sitting on the bench basically because he was lifting up the league and selling so many tickets and, and being this poster boy. And so, you know, we have the sinners, we have, uh, which I really hope Medvedev 
you know, gets himself back in the conversation of, of the big three or four, you know, with Holgar Rune and, you know, hopefully Sisti Pass. So I hope that there is challenge for him, but I do think at the same time as with his success, he almost has this, I don't want to say burden, but this responsibility on his shoulders to really carry the game. And I think again, the NBA is without a doubt the most successful sports league, I think in the world right now, but definitely in the country. And the big reason that they were so successful is how they got, you know, the Gen Z, the millennials, the the younger, whatever we're calling them into the sport. And I think a lot of that was was driven by by the star power, and you know if if the ATP can can put their their marketing minds together, and I mean this is a this is a great story. I think we're we're in for another golden era of tennis as far as the talent goes. It's just you know can we put the marketing to you know to stack it up to the other leagues such as the NBA? Well, if they just allow people to use the freaking footage from the matches for free like the NBA does. You know, like NBA with like all those those Instagram accounts, like that that House of Highlights and stuff like that. They're yeah. basically full businesses where where kids kids maybe don't watch all the matches, you know, but they're going to be seeing the highlights. They're going to be seeing outside of outside of your you know your ATP you know Instagram account or stuff like that. They're so anal about that stuff yeah. uh, about about the the rights of the matches and like. We can't. We can't even watch half the matches because there's 18 different things that we have to be signed up for to watch a match. Let people, let influencers, let people like utilize those. Those. The, the, I mean, I I would love to make like match recap videos on my YouTube channel. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, just like break it down. Like, oh, this situation here, and really talk about it. That's the But they're, you know, I don't want to get a copyright strike. Um, so they're they're really weird about that stuff, and and they're not allowing the I, NBA has grown so much because of the, that the, that social media part, um, and, and it's such an easy thing to do. You don't even have to do work; like it's it's free work and free labor. You know what I mean? So um, there's cer- certain things that that they do that they just shoot themselves in the foot all the time. Um, so hopefully, like they can change that stuff. I mean, I, I've tried like. Uh, to to talk to some people about like the, the footage, but like it's just uh, an impossible thing. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm sure uh, you have they, comments on that too, Gil. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, I was it, gonna it, say you're, so you're preaching to the choir. Yeah, it's so upsetting. So um, I mean, but you have the tennis or... fans' dream in Alcaraz. You have the house of highlights. You have the most explosive player we've seen. You know, as Caruso has since a Federer in terms of just. Mm-hmm. Pure, shot making, yeah. yeah like shot making. coming up with like great every time he plays a match, there's a crazy shot. Like something yeah. that you're like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. Did he do that? Um, and not that many people have that ability, you know, they just don't have that ability. You're like you watch there ten matches, like you're just not gonna see anything that exciting. Um, so like that that's really tough. I think just on the, the Alcaraz, I think um point, I think what's going to be like what would make everything like go, you know, 10 X would be um, the right rival. I think like Novak at the end of his career, like he's the rival right now and it'd be great. But if there's another young gun that come in, that can come in and I, he's had some great matches against Sinner, but Sinner is not winning like the big events enough to get the attention of like the casual fan. Yeah. So like you need like another dude to come in and be like, here, I'm going to take this U.S. Open from you, Carlos. And then the narrative starts, the conversation starts getting, like, really interesting. So I do think he's just going to need the rival. I, I, I think that's – he can say whatever he wants about Hoger and Yannick, but he's winning Masters. He's winning Slams. Those guys are not. So um, once the guy comes in to, to challenge and hopefully take it away from him, um, then I think we, we can see something like we, we saw the last, like, 15 years. Um, but yeah, like ATP, just get your head out of your ass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the viewers of this channel uh, will will appreciate that rant, Karu. There's no doubt about that. Uh, <laughs> I want to end on um, on Osaka, uh, Karu. You were uh, her hitting partner for all four majors that she won, or two. Oh, two. Okay, 2020, two. 2021. Okay. We all know about her tennis. We all know what she was doing on court, what she was accomplishing on court um, in, in her, I would say, almost like part one of her career. We're about to embark on part two because there was a break in between uh, her and her and Corday. 
uh, now have a have a child. She's a mother, uh, but she's coming back Australian Open 2024. I think one of the fascinating things about about Naomi is the the life of being a superstar on tour. Even though she was having all the success, it never seemed easy for her. It always mm-hmm. seemed like a challenge. So, as someone in who was who was close to her or is close to her, I should say. What about her personality made that life or makes that life difficult? Um, I think like, I don't think you need to overthink it too much. I think she's just an introverted person, you know, in general. So like if she was doing anything else in her life, um, she's just introverted. So it, it, I think there's, I think media fans, we kind of have always an expectation that like maybe players have to be, you know, kind of like Roger, just perfect kind of, you know, is able to talk to the media, to people always seem nice and stuff. But the reality is like, we everyone is just human and wired in a, in a much different way. And I think, you know, when I first met her, I, I, I noticed immediately, she, you know, shy, doesn't, doesn't talk a lot at first. And, and, I was just like, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to be like super buddy buddies with her. Like first on like, look, I'm friends with Naomi. I was just like, go do my work, you know, like give her the right space. And she sort of like eventually warms up to you and and everything becomes a little, a little easier. I think like, I think that understanding made our partnership uh, work. Um, Obviously if you're the head coach as as Wim was, I think you're, you're more like, you obviously have to talk more and you have to try to extract more from, from her. Um, but but Naomi is just introverted, and and I think it's a clash between being an introverted person, but also being that big of a superstar. Like it's crazy how big of a superstar she is. It's a, it's actually like a like you know we were training at UCLA, and she would walk like just from the courts to the to the track, and you'd see people like start on the phone and like corner of the eye see the hair, and oh my god, that, that's Naomi, and and so. It, there's that part so she's obviously introverted superstar but she also wants to do a lot of good things right like she, she clearly cares about about you know social issues and, and and things outside of the court fashion and blah, blah blah so she's using that platform to to do all these things that she likes to do um that have interested for her but it's a difficult thing because it's you know usually introverted people i think being around a lot of people all the time sucks kind of the energy out of them. You know, I'm, I'm myself that way. If I'm around people a lot, I need time alone. Um, and, and and she's in a business where time alone is it's not that easy. Um, so it, that that's really what it is. I think I think sometimes people overthink. You know, obviously there are the issues with with um, you know press and all that stuff. Um, and you know she kind of brought that mental health kind of thing to to the forefront. I think in tennis a little bit more. Um, so it, it, I always I've always been like I, I always defend her. I think I've I've had many conversations with people that you know, be like, oh, how was it with Naomi? She seems like she's such a diva and stuff like that. I'm like, she's not a diva. She's just like doing her thing. Like, why do you expect her to do things that please you? You know what I mean? It's like you don't you don't. You don't really mean anything to her. Like you're not part of her life. She's she she's really like I say she's really loyal to her team, to her to her family, to 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 the people around her, and 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 that's something that that maybe people won't see from outside. And, and that's really what it is. I I don't think um, that there's a lot more. I think she gets a lot of shit for for absolutely no no reason because we we again as media as people that are fans we expect a certain a certain conversation from her, a certain way of interacting with her. But like, mm-hmm. if she like can provide that, then we just have to adjust that, ex- that expectation because she's doing a lot of stuff off the core, you know, again, with community, with, with her own stuff that allows her to, I think, voice what she needs to voice without having to be, you know, Roger Feder, basically. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thanks for that. Uh, what are the the twenty four hours like before a major final? Um, <laughs> tense. Uh, there's definitely a lot of tension. It was weird because I I wasn't at the twenty twenty one Australia. I I did all the preseason, but I had some visa stuff that I couldn't go. Um, but I knew she Australia twenty twenty one. I knew she was winning. Like she left playing so well. I was like, 
I was telling people, I was like, she's winning Australia on Open. I was like, that, that. But 2020 was weird. It was the COVID year. And we were basically going from, we were just doing, you know, ho- uh, not hotel. We stayed at a house, house, side, side house. Um, so it is tense. Uh, the ending, the, the end of a Grand Slam um, is a really weird thing because at first you have all these people there. And by the time you reach the quarterfinals, there's there's a handful of people. And then you're in the finals, there's no one there. And at that time, there's really no one there. So I think it is, it's even more eerie. You're just like, ooh, what's going to happen? And all of a sudden, she's down 6 six one two zero in three seconds. And you're like, damn, like all of this two weeks really for, for nothing. And she just found a way. But um, they're tense. They're – but – you know, it's it's a high when you when you win it that it's it's really really cool. Even again with no fans out there, like it, it was a really fun thing. So um, I'm glad I was part of you know both of those. Did like a lot of training with her, and, and you know I think you know, next next year I don't know how how she's going to be mentally, but if she's mentally fresh, I, everything else. I mean the work ethic she 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 puts in the work. You know, outside of you know tennis on court, she doesn't need a lot, but. Um, you know, off court, I, I challenge a lot of guys to, to work out like she works out. Like I've done a couple of the workouts and I was cooked. So, um, you know, she's fresh, mine is fresh, and, you know, watch out, you know, she's going to come out swinging. Yeah. You, you don't forget how to hit the ball. That's for sure. No, no. So um, she's going to come out swinging. It'll be good. Clay, uh, I want to kind of bring this back to improve in a way. I'm wondering, and feel free not to answer in the affirmative here, but a lot of uh, if, if you're you're passionate about creating this this improvement platform, I, I'm wondering if your tennis career led you to this. Like, if the way your tennis career played out, point A got you to point B, and and creating improve. <laughs> Hundred um, percent. And what I would say about Naomi too is, you know, it's the great wooden quote: "It's sports don't build character, they reveal it." And you know, she, I, to her respect, like I think she owns her character, and she's like, "Look, like in order to be a superstar, you have to do, you know, X, Y, and Z with press and obligations and stuff, and that's just not something I want right now." And you know, similarly for me, I think it was a road for me of of finding out exactly what I wanted. You know, I always had this dream of of being this great tennis player and and playing on the biggest stages and for me it was it was definitely about the love of the game and it was about the culture of tennis and it was about just like i i think tennis is one of the greatest mediums in terms of watching a show i mean when you see two competitors that are really giving it their all to beat one another i think it's one of the most fascinating shows you'll see on the planet and so for me i mean that passion really manifested itself in my tennis career and and now as, as someone that's building Improve, I just feel like I want to help more people reveal their character. I want to help more people down that path of becoming kind of, this is our slogan, it's becoming the person you want to be. And whether that's, you know, a great tennis player who never wants to play a professional tournament and just wants to play at their club, or that's, you know, someone that wants to be on center court at the U.S. Open or whatever that kind of goal is for themselves. I just, I want to help people manifest that. And, um, you know, I think the most inspirational thing in the world for me is just seeing people live out their story the exact way that they wanted to. And with my tennis career, I feel like the, uh, we mentioned this last time, the only regret I have in my tennis career is not winning that 2014 NCAA title. Everything else went better than I could have imagined. It's, it was truly a dream come true for me at every stage. And I just want to help more people have that feeling. And I, I just feel like, you know, you, you can accomplish that if you have the right tools and the, the right things fall into place. But for the average person, it just feels so out of reach. And, you know, another quote that we kind of use a lot when we're building improve is when you, when you survey these schools of, you know, especially you know, kind of inner city schools or not, not in like kind of, you know, main, main uh, hubs the kids feel helpless they feel completely hopeless they're just like what what good is it for me to try in school what good is it for me to pursue athletics or pursue arts like i feel like i have no shot in the world and and that you know just breaks my heart i think completely it's like i think everyone should have a shot and everyone should have a roadmap you got to put in the work and it's endless hours of work and dedication but if you are willing to do the work and you have the dedication there should be a shot for you Wholesome, uh, wholesome words and uh, Clay and Carew, 
Really appreciate both of you guys coming on. Improve uh, link is in the description. Curated uh, so expertly by Carew, who, as you guys have heard over the last hour, uh, an extremely sharp tennis mind. And and Clay, you've done a fantastic job um, just managing it all, founding it, creating it. So really excited about all that. And uh, really enjoyed this chat, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for having me.